Well, let's go to our text today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. If you would stand with me. I'm going to begin reading in verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 17. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in the eating, every one taketh before other this own supper, and one is hungry, and the other, another is drunken. What, have you not houses to eat and to drink in, or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not, what shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup, is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as ye drink it and in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood. But let, him, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. We'll stop right there for this morning. Let's pray one more time. Almighty God, thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy today. Thank you for our time of worship. And Lord, let it continue as we hear your word. And Lord, as we uh, receive the, the body and the blood of Christ today, as we worship you, as we remember, as we remember the sacrifice that you made and Lord, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor, for we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. You can be seated. God bless you. I want to talk to you today about the idea of remembering the sacrifice. Remembering the sacrifice. Well, uh, we know that tomorrow, this is Memorial Day weekend, tomorrow is Memorial Day. Memorial Day is a holiday that we have to calls us to remember the sacrifices of men and women who have died in conflict to, while fighting for the freedoms that you and I have today. It's an important time, important holiday that was we take time, as the video instructed us, to take time and to remember and to honor those who pay the ultimate price for the freedoms that we all get to enjoy. And really, most of us take them for granted oftentimes. Just like this morning, we take it for granted that we got up and we uh, got dressed and got ready to come to church and uh, no one forced us to come. No one was standing at the end of our driveway telling us that we could not come. But we all have the freedom to make the decision, the choice of that, to come into the house of God and to worship God and to live for him by the dictation of our hearts, the freedom that we have. There's freedoms abound in this country that we live in. I haven't visited any uh, even close to all of the countries of this world, but I believe that the United States of America is the best country. Amen. The best country and the best nation of this world. I know it's not perfect. Amen. There's a lot of issues, a lot of problems, a lot of things that's going on, and I'm thankful for all of the freedoms that we have, that we get to enjoy. I, I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the men and women who have died to pay the price so I can continue on living in this freedom that is so wonderful, so valuable 
available to you and I. We have so many different uh, freedoms that we have. The freedom, the freedom of speech, right? Freedom of the press, freedom to bear arms, freedom uh, throughout this life of ours that liberty like no other nation in this world really knows all about. And so uh, we get to enjoy that this morning. I thank God for it. And when we think about the many that have uh, died on the battlefield and in conflict as we honor them this weekend, I was doing some research again. The number of men and women who have paid the ultimate sacrifice uh, for our freedom is approaching 1.5 million uh, soldiers. Can you believe that? All the way back to into the 1700s and to our present day, almost 1.5 million soldiers have uh, given the pay the, the ultimate sacrifice to pay for the freedoms that you and I have. And so I thank God for them and we honor them today and tomorrow, of course, as we remember the sacrifice that was made. Well, I, it takes me, it could not help but take me to the teachings of Paul concerning communion and the, the portions of that scripture there in chapter 11 as the Lord is giving instructions when we receive communion, we are remembering him. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Well, we think about the price that was paid uh, not only for the liberty that we get to enjoy as a nation, but we are free today because of the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you and I. When we think about the ultimate price that was paid, he was taking the judgment for our sins when he was arrested and taken to the cross. My mind immediately goes to the place there in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows that his time is approaching. He calls some of his disciples to go with him, and they go into the Garden of Eden, excuse me, the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And in that place, he knowing that the, the really the pressure of the whole world, the weight of the sins, the judgment of the whole world is upon him. And he's praying in such agony there in the garden that the Bible says his sweat begins to turn into great drops of blood. And he's praying there multiple times. He prays this prayer. He says, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Sometimes we may think, well, he's talking about the Roman scourging or he's talking about, you know, hanging on the cross or he's talking about uh, these, all of that that goes together with the, the thought of Mount Calvary and all the other things. But I believe what Jesus was talking about, what was in the cup that he was going to have to partake of was the sins of the whole world. The sin, every sin that had ever been committed before that point and every sin that would be com uh, committed from that point would be laid on Christ as he hung on the cross. You see, it wasn't death that he was afraid of. He had already conquered death. He had raised some back to life again. It wasn't the pain that he was going to have to go through. I'm not discrediting any of the, uh, the, the, the crucifixion that he went through. But what he did not particularly desire to partake of was the sins that were going to be placed upon him. Because he had been born of a virgin. He had lived a sinless life. And he had never tasted what sin tastes like. He had never experienced what sin was like he was sinless he was the perfect spotless lamb of God who was being led to the slaughter amen though he did not even open his mouth and so he was taken there and arrested that night and taken to really a mock uh, trial where he was taken in and also to the Roman scourging the Roman scourging was the place of punishment and uh, really execution of prisoners and criminals there during that time and they took him and tied him to what they called the whipping post and the, 
Roman soldiers would begin to uh, take uh, weapons or torture tools, if you would, that were designed to uh, 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 wound a man and, and torture a criminal, punishing him uh, within an inch of his life. One of those tools was what we're familiar with, the cat of nine tails, and that, that it was a whip type of tool that had nine tails on it, and at the end of each one of those was often bones, if not metal, that was specifically designed that when they would hit a, a human flesh, it would be pulled back and literally would plow rows of uh, stripes, if you will, into the flesh of, of a man. And this is what they did. They they scourged our Lord there at the whipping post. When they were done with that, they placed a crown of thorns on his head, piercing his brow and uh, placing a purple garment around him. And they would kneel down before him and mock him, you see, uh, mocking him and saying things like, all hail king of the Jews. After, not too long after that, it wouldn't be long till they had put the, the cross upon the back of Jesus and Jesus would make his journey on top of a hill called Golgotha, right? Carrying Calvary's cross up the hill uh, to a place where they got there and they laid him on the cross and they secured him to the cross with nails through his hands and through his feet. And as he hung there, they would eventually come by with a spear. They would uh, uh, push it, press it into his side and uh, causing another wound uh, in his side. And eventually when the judgment of God was fulfilled, When the judgment of God was satisfied, oh, hallelujah, when all that had been done to pay for the price of my sins, your sins, and the sins of the whole world, when it was completely done and judgment was satisfied in the eyes of Almighty God, Jesus Christ lifted up his voice and said, it is is finished. <laughs> it is finished. I have completed the job that's been done. I need to tell somebody this morning that the payment for your sin has already been paid. The payment for your sin has been paid in full, paid once and paid for all. Hallelujah. Well, they hurried to take him down after he gave up the ghost. He died there. He gave up his life. There is nothing that they could have done to him that could have taken his life. It was not the stripes. It was not the spear. It was not him hanging there for some time. That was not what took his life. He gave up his life. He said, I'm going to lay down my life, and I have been given power to take it up again. As he died on the cross, he gave up the ghost. So they took him down, and they placed him into a borrowed tomb. A borrowed tomb because it wasn't his and he'd only need it for about three days. He got up out of the grave, amen, and he showed himself alive by infallible proofs that one place at one time over 500 witnesses saw him alive uh, there and uh, to testify that our Lord had risen and then 40 days later he ascended back to the right hand of God and now he's there living alive to make intercession for you and I. I've got even better news he not only left but the Bible says he's coming back in the same way that he left this place he is coming back again can you just praise the Lord with me for a moment right here hallelujah the payment for your sin has been fulfilled he died to deliver us and to save us from our sin 
Before he left, of course, before the crucifixion, he gave us something that the church would do, disciples would do, to help us remember him. And that is to receive the Lord's Supper. He says, when you drink this cup and you eat this bread, do it in remembrance of me. Because every time you do these things, you are showing the Lord's death till he comes. I want to take us a moment here Before we move forward in receiving communion this morning, I want to pray for you. Bow your heads if you would. Almighty God, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and mercy. We honor you today. Lord, we praise you for who you are and what you've done. Lord, yes, we are thankful for our nation. We are thankful for the sacrifice that's been made for the freedoms that we have. But, Lord, I'm thankful for the freedom and the liberty that is available to us spiritually because of the price that Jesus paid on the cross of Calvary. Lord, as I stand here praying over this congregation, I don't know the needs of every life. I don't know the ones who are prepared to meet you. I'm not aware of who and who is not ready for your soon return. But Lord, I'm so thankful that we are still standing in the time of grace that no matter where we are and what we've done or the sins that we have committed, but, Lord, that they can all be under the blood of Jesus as we call upon you and as we repent and turn our hearts to you, Lord, you are able to wash us, washing us in the blood of Jesus to make garments that are stained with sin to make them white as snow, to make them white as snow again. Lord, I honor you today, and I praise you. I thank you, Jesus, for the love that you have for us. Lord, I thank you for loving us when we didn't think that was possible. Lord, I thank you for loving us when we haven't been lovable. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your, the touch of God in our lives that can restore us, that can restore us, that can deliver us, that can heal us, that can save us, that can renew us. You are a loving God and a just God. And we bless you today. We honor you. Lord, I pray for everyone in this congregation. Lord, I pray that your mighty hand would be upon them as we move into this time of a really special worship portion of this service. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and minister to us today as we follow your word. Lord, let us give us a time of worship that it wouldn't be a time of just receiving elements, but it would be a time of worship and remembering what you have done. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me take just a couple of moments here to share with you A couple of the teachings that Paul gives us concerning communion. First of all, let me say you do not have to be a member of our church to receive communion. We invite everyone 
that would desire to worship with us in this time. I would encourage you to only take communion today if you're a Christian, you've been saved, you've been born again, and you're trusting in God and him alone for your salvation. There is something that I always like to speak of because I think it's often overlooked. In verse 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, in our text, I believe we read verse 27. It says there, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I always share the testimony with this verse. Those of you who've been at Good Shepherd for the last eight years, you've heard me say it many times. But there have been people in the past, Christians have accepted Jesus Christ, love the Lord, but they felt uneasy about receiving communion. One gentleman I'm thinking of would never take communion. He was committed and dedicated. He says, no, no, I'm not worthy. That scripture is not talking about your worthiness or my worthiness. Because when it comes down to it, none of us, none of us are worthy. None of us are worthy. But it's talking there about the manner in which you receive. The way that we go about receiving communion. Because if we waited until we were worthy, we would probably never get, we'd have to wait to get to heaven. And it won't be necessary to receive communion in heaven. And so I wanted to mention that this morning. But it is, he does say before receiving communion that we need to examine ourselves. Other places in the scripture speak that examine yourself and to, to see if you're in the faith. So if I would, I've already prayed for you, but and just, just for a moment before I give you any more instructions, every person in the building, can we, take a, can we just take a moment of prayer, self-reflection right there where you're sitting? Just do what the Bible says. Examine yourself. And if there's anything in that heart of yours that doesn't need to be there, Tell Jesus all about it. He already knows, by the way. But tell him all about it. Say, God, forgive me. If you've kind of got off track or whatever your story is this morning, doesn't matter. Just between you and God right there, let's pray for a moment. And just examine it. Just, let's go to God afresh in a brand new way right now. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, I'm not saved. I know I need to be saved. You can come to Christ right now where you're sitting. Sometimes we make it too hard to do that. When you put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins right there as you sit. Declare in your heart and your mind that you're going to serve the Lord from this point forward. Just pray a prayer that speaks of, Lord, I know that you are the Son of God. I know that you died on the cross for my sins. Forgive me of my sins. I am a sinner. Forgive me, Lord. Wash away my sins this morning. As I turn away from them and I turn my heart completely to you. Oh, hallelujah. Wash me clean, Lord. Make me holy as I sit here, Lord. I receive your grace. I receive your blessing. I, I receive forgiveness. I receive today in Jesus' name. Come into my life. Make my heart your home. And by your grace, I'm going to serve you from this point forward. With my whole heart, I serve you. We'll give you just a moment right where you're sitting as you continue to pray. With every head bow, every eye closed, just talk to the Lord from your heart for a moment.